Well, I think we could probably get started. Mark will, he's pretty tech savvy. I think he'll, uh, he'll get on board shortly. Uh, but basically, thank you everyone for, for joining the call today, just to kind of uh, review where we're at. Um, we're hoping that this will probably be the, uh, the final time we all get on the phone together. Um, our previous meetings were in person. I, I think this meeting, just given kind of where we're at, we Uh, we're hoping to, to really do four things today. The first is review uh, the purpose, kind of go through the background again, understand why we're here, what we're doing. The second is to review the edits, which were the, uh, which is what the bulk of the time was spent on at our last in-person meeting. So we'll just quickly walk through each of the set of edits and make sure that they um, have kind of uh, met the needs of the individuals who brought those edits up. The third is to um, review objective two, which is the last uh, few pages of the report, and just kind of talk through um, what those pages mean, what its implications are um, for state government, for, for the agencies on the phone, for, for local partners, and what we're going to do with those recommendations. And then the final uh, being, what are the next steps? Now that um, we're wrapping this group up, what can this group expect in terms of where this report's going to go, who's going to use it, and how we might be able to uh, continue to add value on an ongoing basis for those partners who would like to remain engaged in this space. So those are kind of the four big objectives of the call. I don't think we're, we'll take up the balance of our time uh, completely. I think we can move this along fairly quickly. Um, and hopefully, should any additional edits come out of this process, we can, of course, work those in and distribute those electronically. Um, but, but again, we're hoping this is probably, we're hoping this will be the last time we can all get together, um, barring any major edits or revisions that may come up during um, this call. So everyone should have one document for today. It is the um, fourth iteration of the work-based learning report um, that was distributed um, as an attachment in the email. It's about uh, 10 or 11 pages. Um, there is also a version of it um, that's part of this webinar that, that we'll be able to enlarge and we can point to key sections so we can all follow along together. Um, so starting with that, with that agenda, um, the first um, thing is reviewing the purpose. Again, why are we here? Uh, if everyone recalls, as part of Race to the Top, Illinois had advanced a STEM education strategy um, to try to enhance our college and career readiness reforms. Um, as part of that STEM strategy, we were, we were uh, approaching strategy that we'd be following. Um, we chose that strategy because it also aligned with the state's interest in aligning all of its reforms across the P20 pipeline. And programs of study are uniquely situated uh, to both include um, the elementary, middle school, high school, as well as post-secondary uh, levels of education. And then importantly, why the Department of Commerce is engaged and others as we want, and employers, as we want to make sure we're also bridging uh, the P20 pipeline to employment and those, those important transitions. So as part of that program of study process, uh, we have been uh, launching working groups in each of the sectors. So uh, the nine sectors that we were targeting without going through them all, um, some include health sciences, of which um, Susan O'Keefe is on the phone and, and representing that group. Uh, manufacturing is another one at, at the last meeting. Uh, we had uh, Jim Nelson, uh, Jeff Mays, who have been helping inform that process, uh, so on and so forth. But each of these sector groups were really tasked with coming up with a core sequence and outline. Uh, so how does someone go from a broad orientation level experience within a career cluster to pathway-specific courses? And how do they transition those, that course experience into a post-secondary program? And then what are the types of occupations within that cluster that they can ideally transition into? So they've been really dealing with more of the nuts and bolts of each of the, each of the sectors themselves. Um, but as part of that process, we said there's other key components to a program of study that need to be factored in um, to that core sequence. Uh, one, for example, yield dual credit, um, they should, whether that credit's articulated into a community college or if it's aligned as a dual credit program with a community college or university system. Um, but we said a signature piece of that model is that dual credit opportunities are available. 
another piece is that all students should be assessed across college and career readiness. So in addition to academic proficiency, students should also be um, tested on uh, their employability and workforce skills, which we heard quite a bit about um, early in this process from Leslie Beller um, when she was with Quick, as well as with our Illinois WorkNet team, uh, of which we have Natasha Teleger on the line. Um, and then also, students should be assessed on pathway or technical skills. So to the, and one quick way of validating that is, should students have the opportunity to uh, be able to engage in an industry-recognized certification process? Uh, so can they get that certification, that credential, as a way of validating their experience? So we're defining college and career readiness across uh, those three uh, big uh, legs of, this, uh, of that stool. You know, th those components need to be embedded as part of any program of study. And then last but not least, we uh, identify work-based learning as a signature piece of any program of study. Not something that's nice to have, but something that really should be worked in as part of any program model. Um, so as part of that, we, this group really took up the mantle of saying, how do we uh, create a common set of definitions, much like each of the sector groups are doing, um, so that we have a, a P20 progression of work-based learning opportunities that bring students from a broad awareness through an exploration activity, through more intensive experiences with outside partnerships. We're defining these. That, and part of the process for that is we didn't want the manufacturing group, the healthcare group, uh, the TDL group, uh, the IT group, all coming up with a different kind of sequence, different definitions. But part of this process has been how do we standardize um, our language around programs of study. And we felt work-based learning was ideally situated to come up uh, with a standardized language that could later be used by the partnerships that form the learning exchanges so that they can aggregate resources, aggregate support tools around a common set of definitions. So we know what an internship means in manufacturing. We know what it means in health sciences. It's not that they're all going to be looking the same, but you can imagine how we can create a common set of assessment tools, survey tools, worksite agreement templates that could then be built around these definitions and used by all parties. So it's a way that the, the state and the exchanges can add value to local programs and their adoption of um, these definitions and these experiences. So that's kind of the purpose behind this. I know that was a little long-winded, but I think it's important to, uh, to really encapsulate kind of why we're here um, and, and what this project has been all about. Um, so with that being said, I just wanted to, to check real quick. Does anyone have any questions um, regarding that intro, or should we jump right into kind of what some of the edits are? Okay. Um, I think we could, we could begin to work through the edits. So Natasha, I'm going to try to enlarge this. Am I doing this right? Or yes. should I make and a then, screen? Or? Um, well, I, you could make it, I would make it here. I'm going to scooch it down like this. And then if anybody wants to make it full screen, then at the top of, in the, at the top bar in the upper right-hand corner, it'll say full screen. And they can click on full screen, and it'll make it enlarged. And then that way, if anybody has any chat, they can take notes or put some stuff in the chat pod while you're talking. <clears throat> OK. So the, the report itself. that really this document was pulled together after referencing three other documents, uh, one being the, the Quick Work-Based Learning Guide, another being the, the National Academy Foundation's Guide to Work-Based Learning, and the third being the work that uh, MCHC has engaged in uh, around the Youth Partnership Toolkit. Uh, so we definitely wanted to make, uh, make sure we were recognizing that all those documents heavily informed the development of, of this particular document. Um, then we get to the definition piece, and everyone seemed to be um, satisfied at the last meeting with how we were characterizing the definition. Um, and we broke it up, um, uh, this definition, to four key categories, going from career awareness to career exploration to career preparation and finishing with um, on-the-job training. Um, we had a lengthy discussion at the last meeting around how we were defining career awareness in particular, that first category. Uh, and I know that uh, Jennifer Kopak, who's on the phone with us today, um, had, had uh, some comments on that as well during the last meeting. What we tried to do is modify the description here to best reflect that conversation. And I think some of the key points that we're pointing out here is that you know, we're promoting authentic learning experiences for students, which is uh, aligned with the recommendations that were provided through the P8 STEM working group led by University of Chicago earlier this year, um, but that we're making sure we're promoting both inside and out, outside of school type experiences uh, for students, understanding that they exist in a very broad network 
and that they're not only doing things in school, but they're doing things outside of school with parents, they're doing things at museums um, and after school programs and other areas. Um, that really the family and the community engagement is a key component of any kind of career awareness activity. So I, that's what I felt were kind of some of the, the, the big feedback that we got. I tried to capture that. I had shared this paragraph with Jennifer Kopak, and she made modifications as well. Uh, so Jennifer, I was hoping that you might be able to just speak briefly to this or, or let us know if this uh, meets the needs um, as you identified them at our last meeting. Yeah, I think that uh, it really does. It really does capture what we were talking about, which was, which was really to um, to get away from looking at uh, or missing the opportunity to to talk about how broad um, the idea of career awareness is, sort of in those K to six grades. So we talked to some of our um, elementary specialists here and just tried to capture the feeling of um, that being a very wide open space, but one that you could capitalize on, especially. Um, at the state level, if you were really talking about how important family and community are in uh, exposing kids to just the myriad of experiences that they could, um, you know, they could they could choose as their career. I mean, no one wants to pigeonhole, um, you know, K to six kids, but we wanted to, um, you know, really expand on the idea of how how much fun it can be to to start thinking about what you want to be, you know, when you grow up, and how important uh, those after school. Um, groups can be those you know nonprofits like like ourselves that can you know be a part of a springboard and you know all the different kind of um, you know not internships necessarily but you know people coming into the school inviting you on field trips all those great things that can really get kids um, you know fired up about career so we, we tried to bring a little bit of that into the definition and if anybody had any um, you know any edits or comments and I you know, have no problem in you know incorporating them but we sort of boil it down to that and I, I think it's to say that it's not that those factors aren't important at the in the other categories as well as students uh, progress through their program, but we felt that there was a real need to capture that at this early stage of career awareness and to and how big of a role that plays, particularly in youth who are at the elementary and middle school level. So um, I'm, I'm hoping we capture the capture that. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear, Jennifer, that you were able to consult with, with some of the specialists on your team. It looks like um, Mark Williams. find right here in the report? You know, one little thing I wanted to add was that one of the reasons we felt that we were really drilling down on this one particular definition was that it afforded the state um, a really um, a really wonderful communications opportunity to speak to, um, you know, stakeholders, which are not necessarily always uh, the educators, but to actually reach this message out into the community, into the, the household. So we thought that um, it would be really important to talk to the families um, and really make sure that they understand that while the state is looking to get your older kids um, into you know, career awareness and training opportunities and internships and start thinking about career, it's really never too early to put the word out. And we just thought that might really add to the entire scope of what you're trying to say. And it would really provide a, a really neat springboard to tell that to tell that message. So it was there's a little bit of a um, communications and public relations um, spin behind that as well to to use the younger grades experience as um, you know something that the state is really interested in so just wanted to add that thank you very much Jennifer anyone else have any other comments on the, the definition of work-based learning portion of the report or do we have it cooked <laughs> okay let's uh, let's move forward um, so the next section actually talks about the P20 work-based learning sequence. So here we are trying to say, um, let's look at the P20 sequence, then let's look at how the categories match up to that sequence, and then identify what specific set of activities match with each category at that level of sequence. Uh, so we have a, a, a handy little chart here that actually shows the breakout, um, and I'm going to discuss some important edits that have taken place since the last meeting. The first. Um, really starts with the third paragraph, where it begins with the method of delivery of these activities. And here we had a rich discussion, a discussion um, primarily led by After School Matters, about the need to um, exemplify that this is a diverse delivery network, that we're not really dealing solely with a student school of record, but that we need to um, give proper um, recognition to the fact that uh, 
given where we are today, students are engaging in life-wide learning across a variety of different social and professional networks. Um, this was also a point brought up um, by Jeannie Kitchens with our Illinois WorkNet team about the need to um, show within that diverse delivery network that technology plays a very important role. Um, so this, uh, there was some language that was added here to best try to capture that diverse delivery discussion. Um, so here we, we mentioned some of the key points I just reviewed. In particular, we referenced that um, technology tools, after school programs, student organizations, and, then if, and other methods not defined here are all viable solutions for students to engage in meaningful work-based learning opportunities, um, and that they all can be considered part of a student's program of study. They do not have to be completely structured and run through a school program, but there's a, a much broader way of looking at how students are interacting in these environments, uh, which again makes it all the more important that to the extent students are engaging in, in work-based learning experiences outside of that immediate school environment, we need to make sure that we are building supports and tools to help structure that engagement, um, which makes this activity all the more relevant. So we're building the kinds of tools to facilitate those connections and making sure that we are capturing that experience and, and having appropriate feedback of which the school can, can access, leverage, and understand what's going on in that student's personalized program of study. Um, so that language was added here. Um, I know uh, After School Matters was not able to join us today. Um, Jeannie uh, Kitchens also wasn't able to join us, but I know we have Natasha on the phone. Uh, so Natasha, I didn't know if I could put you on the spot and to see if you had any kind of feedback, if we're actually accurately capturing um, this diverse delivery discussion or if we need any additions. Uh, so Natasha, I was hoping to hear from you first, and then if anyone else wants to chime in, we can do that as well. Um, no, I didn't have any additions this time. So. Okay. Anyone else or any other comments? Or is this adequate? Do we need to add to it? Do we need to revisit this? I think you got it down. I think we we talked it, you know, over pretty well at the last meeting. So mm -hmm. I, I think you're in a good space. Okay. I think what's good too is it gives organizations a way to kind of, I hate to use the word defend, but to justify their role in that space when they may not be obvious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like an arts program has now a vehicle with which to say, you know, we are participating in part of this because we hit these kinds of outcomes. To yeah. put it on paper without having to have to describe it all the time. Great point. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and actually, this got me thinking about some of the um, activities, uh, some of the biotech communities engaged in. I, I know we have Ann Reed on the phone. Um, and I'm thinking about, uh, and is, is it Estellas that developed their mentorship program with the online module? Okay, I'm not sure if Ann's still on the phone. Um, no, no, I'm still on. I'm sorry. It takes me a minute to unmute my phone here. Oh, no um, because uh, I'm calling in from my mobile. Um, yes, well, Astellas has a, um, Astellas uses, what, social networking uh, to reach out to students. And, you know, they've, they run into some roadblocks with that. That's not the easiest thing for a company to do, especially like now pharmaceutical companies are seriously limited in what they can actually do online. Um, so... Yeah, but it, you know, definitely Astellas is creating a vehicle for reaching out to students using online and social networking. Does that help? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think this description helps capture kind of that level of engagement that they're trying to promote, which, which isn't being delivered through direct partnerships with schools, but they have developed a tool. And how does that tool necessarily fit with the student's education and career plan? Um, and, and this shows how it, can be, uh, how it can be factored in as part of a personalized program of study. So. Uh, I, I think we, we got it there. We kept it nice, concise. I think it gets to the point of the conversation we had, so I, I think that's cooked and we can move on. Um, when we get to the actual sequencing, um, there were two key points made. The first is... Oh, wait, Jason, Jason, yes. can I interrupt you for one second? I'm Absolutely. sorry, and I, I, maybe I missed some of these prior conversations. But in terms of, so an activity like Estellas engaging with the students, mm -hmm. um, what, and tell me if I'm totally out of line here, what... Uh, mechanism or who would be responsible for judging the work done by the student, the relationship with the partner, and so that it could be, you know, credit, so the student could receive credit from it. Mm -hmm. Does well, that make any sense? That makes sense, and, and I would encourage folks who are more authoritative on this to, to chime in, particularly you, Mark. Uh, but I mean, ultimately, when it comes to whether or not something's going to be accepted as credit, I believe that's going to be a local district decision. 
Um, so, I mean, that, that's local control. Um, what we okay. can do is by structuring the experience and providing some kind of standardized tools that have been vetted and we know are, are quality, it could be that these tools are, are adopted by local districts as being appropriate assessment and survey tools uh, that could be included as part of um, some agreement that the student can take that for credit or at least that it's something that a teacher can recognize and use um, or even a guidance counselor can, can take and use when interacting with that student. But I, I think the key is coming up with a set of tools that the community knows, understands, approves, and respects. Um, but in terms of coming out with like a, a policy to say, you know, any student that engages in this outside experience should get credit. I mean, that's something that for, that's for our Objective 2 conversation later on today. Okay, okay. Um, but if anyone wants to add to that or add some clarification, I'm kind of shooting from the hip on that answer. Uh, Mark, well, do you have anything to add? These are some of the templates you talked about, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Jason, you're right. The, uh, the grant of credit is always a local decision. Uh, the only other angle we have on that is the, is the state river to develop statewide articulation uh, for community colleges. but. Uh, Basically, I think you're right, to provide the best tools so that the local decision should have some structure to it. And so uh, if a board is going to grant uh, the credit, they, they feel that it's in a credible context. Mm -hmm. yeah, and Anna, I think as we look at program of study adoption, that is a conversation that a local district needs to have with itself to say, if we are building these core sequences and we do want students to have work-based learning experiences and some of those are going to take place outside of the school, how are we going to manage that? Um, what types of tools are available to us and how do we factor that in for the purposes of credit um, or just for the purposes of even, uh, I mean, if, when you look at like co-ops and other experiences, students might need a portion of their day uh, to spend on that kind of activity. So I, ultimately that has to be part of a, a local discussion though and I think we want to set up that discussion to be as successful as possible and that's where we can add the best value by creating tools, creating matchmaking services, creating a lot of transparency around the process. Jason, do we hey, mention thanks. digital badging at all in this? Because I know that's suddenly the hot topic that everyone's talking about. Are we even, I mean I know the, the rubric is, is just, you know, just starting to get funded to put a framework together but that seems to be the offshoot of all this credit and certification is that there needs to be like another, um, another world, another cloud of, of ways to recognize um, you know, 21st century skills. Is that something that we're going to add in this or, or ha is, are we steering clear of it altogether since it's oh. so new? Did you say digital tagging? Digital badging. Badging. Okay. I, I'm not even familiar with that term. Okay. Um, I mean, it's just all of a sudden it's, you know, it's the hot topic amongst um, there's a huge competition that they just uh, they've been announcing, and I was just in a meeting this week with some um, like Fed folks, and they're they're just going crazy about um, right now. There's there's such a focus on only certain kind of you know pigeonholed certifications, and they want 21st century skills to be recognized and for students to be able to accumulate. And whatever we think of this, if this is a good or a bad idea, um, you know, I think that's almost uh, the horses out of the barn on it. And it's something that people are going to be talking about. Um, they're trying to take all different types of skills and experiences and give you some sort of, I mean, in a way, I think they're almost looking at a grown-up sort of boy or Girl Scout badging system, I mean, if you will. And it's sort of taken as an offshoot of all the social media badging that's going on which is, um, you know, in a way uh, pretty, pretty, pretty goofy, you know, if you, if you want to be critical of it. But I think that seems to be this, this hot trend. I mean, there's a lot of people putting money behind digital badging of skills. So I'll send you something that I just got yesterday. Okay. And that, is, that seems to really dovetail with what we're talking about because, just like you said, there's not a way to necessarily – to necessarily check off a box to say your experience yielded you experiences that kids are doing, that students are having, that need to be recognized in a way that's not credit or you know work mm -hmm. or whatever. So that might fit into this. So I'll send you um, I'll send you a link to to something I got yesterday, okay? Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, I know, Lynn, uh, you were asking uh, about who was speaking. Uh, that's Jennifer Kopak. She's with Science Olympiad. 
Um, so whatever information she shares, I'm happy to make that available to the group as well. Um, but uh, this is certainly a new concept for me. I think um, if, if it's okay with you, Jennifer, we can revisit it once we get to objective two. Okay. And we could maybe even identify that as something to be explored. Let me see um, if I can find a link and I'll put it in the chat room and you guys can peek at it a little bit later. Okay, certainly. I mean, when we talk about uh, you know the assessment framework, we want to make sure we are providing ways of verifying that students have certain skills, okay. uh, whether those are pathway skills, uh, technical skills, uh, workforce skills. So I think uh, after your description, I'm wondering if, if it kind of fits within the context of that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but let's definitely revisit that. I think I need to do my homework. If, if anyone else has heard about this or has some burning remarks to make, I encourage them to do so now. Um, but I, I, I think that's where I would leave it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next... Uh, uh, or, go sorry. Ahead. This, this is Lynn. Um, I'm, I wonder if you could speak to, and, and I may have missed some conversations, but I wonder if you could speak to uh, more what you mean by personalized program of study. Are you are you talking about a, a career cruising kind of document that's mm -hmm. online? Mm -hmm. That yeah. The, uh, the are, are you familiar with the program of study model as, as right, it was right, defined right. by yeah, the yeah, State yeah. Board of Ed, just, College Board? Yep. Well, so I wonder if you're thinking of a document that is their personalized program of study. Yeah, I think well, we, we use it kind of as an amorphous concept, um, but ultimately what, what we're trying to move towards is to say, you know, every student has an education career plan. In some cases, it's defined through an application like career cruising, which, which helps mm -hmm. create that form. In some cases, this is developed just in consultation with a guidance counselor. Um, but what we're, we're trying to say is, that, you know, every student in has a program that they're in. And we use program of study. It's kind of borrowed language from the, from the career and technical education community. But we're essentially saying is we're trying to move students towards personalization where they're creating this plan for themselves. Um, it would be great as a product of this that we actually come up with some a variety of tools for educators to use, including career cruising, including other types of vendor applications that students can make these portfolios and plans with. But saying, you know, how do you, how do you match the course sequence you've identified yourself with the types of assessments and certification opportunities you want to leverage, with the kinds of work-based learning experiences you want to take, and ultimately it's going to look different probably for all students. Um, everyone's going to have a different, differently tweaked plan. It's going to be tough to say everyone needs an internship, but um, what we're trying to say is a program of study should be a very personal experience for a student to explore their academic and career choices. So that's what we meant by that. Does that answer yes, your that's, question? Yes, that's helpful. Thank okay. you. Um, all right. Well, th there was two key um, changes made to the P20 sequence. Uh, one was uh, recommended by a few people, which was to break out the middle school component. Uh, I think Bob Sheets actually led a discussion around that. Um, before we had, uh, it was a P8. kind of one, um, one category line to career exploration. Uh, so we just wanted to make sure that students um, who were starting this process earlier in middle school um, were, had the opportunity to do as more exploration-oriented activities, much like a student in her freshman and sophomore year of high school would have access to. So again, these are not hard and fast rules. This is not set in any kind of concrete or stone. It's merely a, a recommended sequence um, for, that, it, that we can begin to use when students, educators, guidance counselors are putting together um, this kind of uh, personalized program of study. So uh, there's a lot of overlap here, but we're just trying to create a basic framework to structure our thinking and conversations around it. So we added middle school understanding that those activities would be included. And then uh, before we get comments there, the other addition was we broke out bridge programs um, at the post-secondary level. Uh, bridge programs are, are really programs aimed at adults. Um, who are re-entering into education or who are transitioning, who have remedial skill needs. Um, so it's their, their math uh, or their reading skills are not quite up to snuff for college level um, courses that are credit bearing. So bridge programs are often there to, in fact, bridge that divide. Um, so they're there for that population to come in, get access to some of those tutoring services, remedial education courses with the idea that they're going to use that experience to successfully transition into a program where they can earn a credential, a certificate, or to enter into a degree program. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a set of programs. There's been a, a variety of pilot sites across the uh, state um, with the Community College Board who have launched bridge programs. Um, it, it's a hot area that DCO has supported, and we want to make sure that it is recognized here as another kind of on-ramp, uh, that we will have a body of students coming in through bridge programs who will need access to work-based learning opportunities, much like 
a high school student would, or a student in a university system. Um, so we wanted to make sure we're recognizing that there are some prescribed activities that uh, happen more often than others within that bridge program setting, including problem-based learning. Uh, Bob Sheets had requested we break that out, and that's been added here. Um, so just real quick, do we have any comments, concerns, questions about the modifications that were made to the P20 course sequence, being the inclusion of the middle school, um, as well as the breakout of the post-secondary post bridge programs? I'm fine with it. I think the service learning people are going to be very happy. <laughs> to have a kind of, I think the service learning people are going to be very happy about this, to have kind of a new context. I think with the kind of movement towards a very strict college and career focus, mm -hmm. they've been trying to find kind of a home in that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this will provide a new avenue for them to kind of support that work. Mm -hmm. And it's an actually very large community to be advocating with us, so I think it's going to be great to include them in this. We don't have people from that background on the team, on the committee here, but I do think as we go forward, it might be good to bring them in. Yes, I, th I think it's a very good observation. and. Um, Lynn, you asked about the, the program of study approach before, and I, I think this also exemplifies that pr uh, previous description because you'll notice, for example, career exploration pops up all over the place. And the idea is that not every student is going to come in and have the ideal set of experiences at the ideal time in their life, um, but that we have uh, youth coming in in one area, we have adults re-entering a system at another area, and depending on where your on-ramp is, you're going to need access to different kinds of experiences. Uh, so we wanted to show how at each stage of the P20 sequence, there were different ways students can get that exploration activity, that preparation activity, or the on-the-job on the training. Um, also for students who go down one pathway, but they decide the same for me anymore, I want to try something else, I want to exercise my choice, um, it gives them, it says, you know, there still should be opportunities later in life for them to go back and get those exploration-related activities as well. Um, so we try to make it where we're dealing with a very diverse kind of student population. Okay. Thanks um, very much, uh, Jason, and, and I um, really will be listening to see what kind of uh, digital uh, encouragement we can give to this, uh, to managing the, uh, the personal uh, program of study um, portfolio. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think we can we can uh, talk a little bit more at length about. one of the few places that we can actually move the ball forward over the next year. Um, I know we have a discussion going on in the uh, on the sidebar there. Jenny, did you share the link to the I digital did. badges? Okay. I did. I did. I mean, and it just you know just came out yesterday, and um, I just happened to be in that meeting with uh, someone from NASA who mentioned it yesterday, and um, you know I didn't know a lot about it. I had kind of heard the term thrown around. I could have sworn it was you that told me about it. Um, but I guess not. I was going to attribute it to you, though. But it, it's, well, thank you. It's definitely, it, it definitely. If if anyone looks at this link, um, it's you know from the MacArthur Foundation there, announcing that they have grant money for this. Um, and it it just when you read it, it's exactly what we're talking about all the time. What we're always talking about in these meetings. What we're trying to um, you know kind of put our finger on these different types of skills. I mean, people are hot and bothered talking about, you know, 21st century skills and not necessarily um, checking the exact boxes that we're so used to in terms of our different types of assessments. So um, I'm, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not sold on what the idea is. I'm, I'm not really, uh, you know, incredibly knowledgeable about it yet either, but it, <laughs> just from the reactions of, of the people that uh, certainly are in the know. I mean, and look who's announcing this. It's you know Arnie Duncan himself. And if this is the um, what people are very excited about and, and putting you know or throwing money at, it certainly seems like it's something that that we're going to be all faced with very soon. So perhaps the sooner uh, we can be um, you know ahead of the curve, the, the better. And this might be something that I know nothing about the you know specifics or parameters of this competition. But if there's a group that's looking to be a part of designing, you know, parameters, looking at 
traditional assessments versus new assessments, that sort of thing. Um, I would think that this this group and the P20, um, you know, Career and College Readiness Committee. I mean, all the. Thank you very much. Uh, so everyone has the link there. Um, assuming no further comments on the, the adjustments made to the P20 sequence, I would like to move on to the work-based learning definitions. And here uh, we have a couple paragraphs that have been modified to reflect a discussion we had at our last meeting. Um, what was discussed was we need, wanted to do a better job of breaking out the difference between recommended prerequisites uh, as well as um, outcome assessments. Uh, so I tried to put some clarifying language there, and I think I could even add more to it. But but the idea here is the, um, the, the technically, I guess, the second paragraph there, um, where it says, as of uh, a set of recommended prerequisites. Here we're really focused on you know students having prepared a personalized education and career plan, which can be done through a variety of different activities, um, including using something like career cruising. Um, there is a workforce readiness assessment, and this is uh, work that we heard quite a bit about um, uh, as done by uh, Leslie Beller and the Quick team, um, as well as our Illinois WorkNet team, um, in trying to define you know, what are the key workforce and employability standards that need to be assessed. Um, I know that um, at DCEO and through Illinois WorkNet, uh, we've been using the NACTI employability assessment. Um, Another, uh, uh, Jeff Mays at our previous meeting had brought up the ACT work keys as an assessment that that's, uh, plays in this space. Uh, but just the idea that you know students should be assessed on their readiness to be in a work environment prior to actually entering into it. Um, and I know Leslie spoke at length about kind of the need to make sure that students who are going into those experiences um, have a level of assessment that gives a guarantee to the employer that this is going to be a quality experience and that students are going to be professional in that environment and are going to get the most out of it. So we added the workforce readiness assessment piece in there. And then finally, that they're proficient in academic disciplines. Uh, so to the extent that we know that they, they can do basic math, they can do reading, they can write, um, they have literacy skills, uh, to the extent that any of those are a prerequisite before entering into a work environment, uh, we want to make sure that that's identified as a potential prerequisite. And not that these three prerequisites are required across all, but you'll see in the definitions breakout, we do mention in specific areas where the prerequisite would be most appropriate. And those are usually taking place at the career preparation and on-the-job training type activities uh, where they're going to be engaging in an adult environment. Um, the outcomes piece was broken out into an observational assessment, and that was based on the discussion that Leslie Beller led um, uh, around you know, what uh, CPS is using as an observational assessment and survey tool. Um, basically, if you're engaging in it with an adult, how do you capture that adult's feedback on that student's performance, given that they're not necessarily the teacher of record for that student? Uh, so there's some unique tools that were developed by CPS to do that, and we want to capture that as a potential assessment of that experience. And then finally, industry-recognized certification. To the extent, uh, and this was brought up by the Illinois Business Roundtable at our last meeting, to the extent that a student has an opportunity to validate their skill attainment through the acquisition of a credential, we want to make sure that that serves a purpose in terms of saying this student was successful in that experience, and we're given this as, as validation. Uh, so those two pieces were added. I would actually like to add additional language, just referencing the context that we did have an assessment working group composed of Illinois WorkNet and uh, QUIC at the time. That, that kind of help break this out, um, and also recognize that the P20 Council's um, Committee on College and Career Readiness had actually recommended a similar set of assessments as part of the work that they have been engaged in. So just kind of giving additional context that there's other players here that have, that have contributed input here, and this isn't existing in any kind of vacuum. Um, so again, um, I think that was more than a thorough explanation. Sorry, I'm being a little long-winded. But do we have any comments um, with respect to how we're defining the prerequisites and outcomes? Does this accomplish the job, or do we need to add more? I think the, it's good about the industry-recognized certification being broad enough that if kind of a badge movement or some other kind of a codification of skills comes aboard, mm -hmm. that we just support that it's an industry-recognized, you know, validated on by some evidence. But I think that term does, or I can ask the group, do you think that term does cover the new range of tools and resources that are coming out? or certification already have a very specific industry kind of skill-based language that might exclude all these other kind of things that are coming? Well, I think there, it's just a, it's a thought to maybe not lock into that. I mean, that's my, that's my uh, I think the, the reason this is all coming to bear is that people have felt you know, constrained by if I can't 
if I can't be certified, then I'm nothing. Then my skill is worthless, sort of thing. Right. So it's you know, if there's at least a recognition of this movement of maybe a different word or just maybe to add that in, um, just to be aware of it, it just might, you know, it might uh, be a little little more freeing. Mm -hmm. Could it be certification, comma, or new develop newly developed tools under you know some kind of way to say we are open to things that are evidence based but don't necessarily have to be an industry certification sponsored by kind of an association. I think industry certification has kind of a, it draws up a very particular idea in mind for most people's heads. Yeah, I just want to add right. some language to make it a little broader to include, you know, anything that captures someone's skills and verifies those skills and something that's recognized by people from that industry mm -hmm. um, versus a certification which already has connotation. Okay, I could definitely capture that language. I, I think that's well put. Are you thinking it more like endorsed instead of like a certification? Because that's one of the things that we've been talking about is um, with the assessment work group is, um, you know, uh, getting local endorsements for their overall program, which contains all these other assessments. I don't know. Okay, so you would uh, recommend adding the word endorsed. recently with the stuff I've been working on. Okay. I could definitely uh, work that in there in the definition. I'll wordsmith it. Uh, anything else? No. If not, we we can uh, move on. We could always come back to if someone gets a question later. But there, uh, or the next part of the report actually launches into the definitions themselves. So here are the activities that were identified in the sequence before. We have a definition and then identification of whether or not there's a prerequisite or outcome assessment that's recommended as part of that activity. Um, so we did not get to any trouble until we got down to the college and career fairs component. And here, I do not believe I actually modified the definition since we've last seen it. There was some concern that it wasn't a robust enough description, but in my notes I had it that the primary discussion really centered on that students can engage in a virtual environment in college and career fairs. Um, and we wanted to capture that. So in lieu of, of, of identifying the technology component across all these activities, that was just handled earlier, um, which we had discussed as we're kind of saying there's all kinds of delivery mechanisms for this, including technology, which cuts across all activities. Um, so given that Uh, so I was hoping to get some feedback from the group if we still needed to revisit this or if it's sufficient enough for the purpose of the report at this date. And I know I'd, I think Jeannie Kitchens led part of that discussion. She, unfortunately, she's not with us today. Uh, but does anyone yeah. feel strongly about this? I mean, I don't know if she felt strongly about it because it just specifically calls out, you know, workshops and hands-on activities as opposed to, I don't know. Okay. I mean, I, I'm more than willing to... Uh, I don't know exactly what she had in mind, but... Yeah. I mean, I could add a technology reference in there just to cover our bases. No problem okay. there. You um, could just but, say, and other virtual or hands-on activities. There you go. Okay. Uh, Aside is, from, Lynn, yep. and is there is there a reason that there's no outcome for the first few? Uh, even if there's no prerequisite? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, that was just my generic way of approaching this, saying, you know, once I got to, like, the, I believe it was the career preparation activities. So career preparation and on-the-job training as, as categories, I started attaching the prerequisites and outcomes to those, but I had not done it for the awareness and the exploration activities because I felt that there was just, they, they weren't necessarily a structure of experiences. Um, but that can certainly be added here. Um, last meeting, I, I kind of put that up to the group to say, this was my generic approach. Do we need to, to modify it? And we got caught up more in terms of expanding upon our understanding of outcomes and prerequisites and not necessarily going through on an activity-by-activity -activity basis. But if you have a particular kind of um, assessment that should be included for college and career fairs or for those other activities, um, um, my ears are more than open. 
I think what might be good is saying outcome assessments, because obviously there's outcomes to a career fair that are very specific in terms mm -hmm. of exploratory. So maybe it's things that we have a specific formalized industry-wide assessment for. That's what you've put in there. Because if you look at kind of how you've decided to find outcomes, it's really much more assessments. Okay, so it I might need just to be like outcome my... assessments okay. versus. And as if I know now, there's lots of feedback debriefs from career fairs and whatnot, but no one's created kind of a pre and post kind of assessment. Like, what would it be yet? Which I think it's a potentially interesting idea. Okay. And I think the heading too. It looks like um, when you first start reading the things that it looks like, yeah, there might not be a prerequisite, but there's certainly an outcome to problem-based learning. There's certainly an outcome to competition. So to say none under that heading just, you know, might just be misconstrued. Like there's no outcome. Right. Just, I would maybe just use the word formalized assessment. Right. Okay. I mean, I, I, I would. Think one change I would like to make is I would include a prerequisite for those career exploration activities being an education and career plan. Given that the way we define career awareness as an activity concludes with students actually, they should be developing one of those. So it's not to say you have to, but we're recommending that for career exploration activities, you should at least minimally have an education and career plan. Not necessarily have a workforce readiness assessment completed, but you should have some kind of plan in some form. Is that okay with the group? It could be an actually input and outcome. Oh yeah, that's that's a good point. And I, yeah, perfect. Or is, and now would we call it outcome or assessment? I mean, it almost could be, I mean, it could, if you want to have some kind of formalized outcome product that comes out of those activities, then mm -hmm. I think a plan is kind of the best thing without constricting it to some kind of skill acquisition. Okay. I think I could play with that. I, I agree. That this is Lynn. Um, I, I think it really strengthened uh, your, your document here to say that all of these awareness activities have important outcomes and that they can be captured in this plan. I'm reading furiously. Okay, so I can make those adjustments and maybe even come up with some uh, some additional language. And I'll I'll be sure to circulate another iteration of this report around, so you'll see if I adequately captured that. But I think those are definite. Uh, important additions to the report. So thank you for those comments. Um, and I will I'll get back to everyone. Anything else with respect to the college and career fairs? Uh, the other change that was made to the definitions is, is just below under internships. Uh, there we had Blau Karras from the Business Roundtable. Um, he had some questions about some of the timing that was identified as part of the definition for internships, where we actually listed like the number of hours a student should experience. And we had a, a discussion about, well, you know, there's, we really need to have more flexibility because we do want to say that there is a, a critical amount of time that minimally needs to be spent to have a quality internship. However, you know, internships could be offered during the summer, during a spring break. Um, they could be done during, uh, over a semester. And depending on the length of the internship, could could change how much time a student spends in any given week. Um, so we removed some of the more prescriptive language and made it flexible, saying that it's really contingent upon the, the amount of time a student can commit to the experience um, versus the length of time that the experience is taking place. Um, so it's we added that flexibility in there. And uh, uh, basically, I just want to make sure we capture that adequately um, for the working group's notes. outcome slash assessment language um, to try to capture the career awareness and career exploration activities. Um, and I will pass it around for circulation. And folks will let me know if I got it right or if I could tweak it more. Um, certainly, uh, Lynn or others, if you wanted to uh, have more direct input into that before that next version gets circulated, I would just encourage you to shoot me an email with your notes or give me a call. Um, and I'll make sure I capture that input before it gets circulated again. Okay. Perfect. Well, we can keep moving here. Um, that pretty much gets to the bulk of the edits that I had captured at our last meeting. And, and where we finished was roughly at this space with the internship discussion before we ran out of time. Hmm. The next part of the report, um, folks had reviewed, but we had not uh, necessarily had an in-depth discussion. Um, objective two was really um, focused on how do we identify key incentives policy recommendations and resources and support tools um, to help increase 
the number of work-based learning opportunities and make sure that those are um, successful and meaningful experiences. So what we did is we broke up the targets into three big groups. The first group being schools, educators, and counselors. The second group being students. And then the third group being industry and employers. And once we broke those targets up, we really got into saying, you know, what are some of the, the, the key, you know, we added some uh, language around barriers. Uh, we're, you know, we can go through that if we want. But, but the real meat is the last two um, columns where we talk about, you know, what are specific incentive rec recommendations and then what, it would be, what would be the implementation strategy for it. Now, obviously, these are very short statements. We're not trying to, to, to create policy briefs under each of these. But it was just a way of saying, as this work continues over the next uh, few years, as we launch learning exchanges, as we develop this interagency committee of education and economic development agencies who are going to be coordinating um, the learning exchange activities, how can, what advice can we be giving to them to say, this is where you should focus your efforts to make work-based learning uh, more of a substantial experience in a student's life? And these are ways that you can remove barriers to help them and to help local school districts, to help after school programs, um, to help industry associations and partners um, make these opportunities available. Um, so I, I'm not sure we need to walk through each one of these. What I can do is I'd like to kind of just touch on them um, and then quickly identify um, which areas we are well positioned to move forward on. So for example, when we look at the students, uh, or I'm sorry, schools, educators, and counselors, the first is to make sure we're subsidizing some kind of professional development experience. And one of the programs that was previously discussed was the VIP program, which used to provide a subsidy for educators who actually went and got work experience. Um, the next one is looking at the actual uh, regulations around how a teacher maintains their teacher certification by gaining a certain amount of CPDU credits and how we can tie CPDU requirements um, to, to, uh, to teachers actually going and receiving some level of industry training. Um, the third area is looking at uh, career development guidance and portfolio applications. Um, much like Lynn has brought up earlier, to what extent are we creating the next generation of digital tools, virtual tools that can assist with delivering career development guidance as well as um, managing portfolios. And that is an area I will mention uh, that we're well positioned to move forward on because we want to link that recommendation to the work of the learning and performance management system. That's the cloud-based infrastructure the state is looking to develop where that student vault concept um, is really a key part and, and that LPMS will be the platform by which the learning exchanges will be able to coordinate and facilitate, facilitate their interaction. So we think that through that process, we can make sure that we are targeting career development guidance and portfolio applications. So there's some, there's some money back there, there's some partnerships developing there, and we can make sure that that's part of the discussion. Um, the next area is uh, workforce readiness assessment framework and tools. Um, so to the extent that uh, you know, Illinois WorkNet, um, uh, Quick, and others have been uh, developing this assessment framework, we can continue that effort. Uh, I would also add, like to add a reference to PARC as the common core group. As they're developing these assessments, we want to make sure um, that they're developing assessments that target workforce and employability skills. So I'll be sure to add that language. And uh, fifth is report card metrics. That is where we are um, trying to create a new way of assessing uh, district and school performance. Um, that's being done through the P20 Council. And, and we can make sure work-based learning is a category of that performance, or at least tracking which schools and districts are offering what kinds of experiences. And then finally, financing, which is new. Um, this was added since our last conversation. And this was based on some feedback I got from Leslie Beller, um, which is how do we make sure that we can look at how um, students' formula funding works and how financing works so students could use a portion of the funding that is given, uh, that supports their education, and use it to support access to work-based learning opportunities. Uh, so if we were ever to kind of unpack that financing question, where does work-based learning fall in between? So again, those, those are six areas targeted for schools, educators, and counselors. Three of the six, three, four, and five, are areas that we have some on-the-ground activity currently taking place. And the other areas are just being brought up to say, this is something we, look, we can look at in the future. So I wanted to stop there after going through that target group to say, does anyone have any comments, um, concerns, or would anyone want to add additional areas to be explored as part of that, that listing there? This is Lynn. This is a question about number two, career guidance. Uh, is there uh, someone who's connected to the career guidance system on this particular uh, committee? Um, okay, when, when you say 
two, are you, are you referring to number okay. three actually, where it says career development sorry, guidance? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mark, are you still on the phone? Mark? Jason, still, yeah, yes. still on the call. Did, I, I was wondering if you wanted to address Lynn's question. Lynn, could you restate the question? I'm just, I'm in a noisy place. This is about career guidance, and uh -huh. um, I just wondered if there was um, someone connected with career guidance is on this particular committee. Uh, well, that would be me, I think. Okay. Guidance counselor or the association guidance counselors. Uh, we have not had them directly involved now. Thank you. Uh, but this is certainly an area that, um, as we want to develop these kinds of tools, we want to make sure that community is engaged to inform that process. So here I just kind of said, for as far as implementation goes, that's everybody. It's an interagency team. Um, so that's commerce agencies working with the State Board of Ed, working with higher ed groups to say, you know, if we're going to be developing new tools or making tools available um, to all districts, you know, what should those tools be? What do they look like? What kind of data are they drawing upon? How are we financing those tools? Given the LPMS project is, is going to be moving forward, we think that's an area that those conversations can be fruitful in the f near future. Does anyone Just else to have follow up on the guidance part, we worked very closely at CTE and CPS with the high school guidance counseling department to make sure everything was aligned and that all of the new tools rolled out by guidance counseling aligned to this continuum and these definitions and the programs of study. So. They're not directly involved, but I do know that they have verified and supported the work that we've been talking about and even the specific recommendations. Thank you, Leslie. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Well, we can uh, move on to the second um, targeted list, a shorter number of recommendations. That's uh, for students. Um, the first, which starts with number seven, is matchmaking applications. Uh, so to the extent that we can, in a virtual environment, develop um, kind of the eHarmonies and Match.coms for work-based learning, that's an area we'd like to explore as part of this cloud computing system that we hope to launch. Um, so this is an area, again, that there could be, um, uh, these could be private sector applications developed through groups like Career Cruising and others, or it could be um, that these are applications developed um, as a default tool by the state, uh, much like we have What's Next Illinois as a, uh, a guidance tool uh, developed by the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, though some other schools wish to purchase proprietary systems. So we're curious to say that once you have these definitions, you can create standardization. It's perfectly situated to create these set of kind of matchmaking applications to help facilitate connections and help reduce some of the, the burden that local districts have in, in having to manage that process themselves. That, of course, applies not only to local school districts, but also to community colleges and university systems. Um, that's an area that I'm also saying is we can move forward on given the work that's being invested as part of the LPMF. Uh, number Kellogg eight. is also yep. another you know, group we're on with Kellogg. They have just funded a multi-million dollar kind of platform development mm -hmm. um, being run out of D.C. and Baltimore with a very large youth agency about creating and really, and it has a lot of the badges and it uses a lot of that gaming technology and everything that Jeff is talking about. So um, I can share that as it becomes more online. And it's designed to be kind of licensed and open. Um, oh, that's great. I'd be very yeah. curious and about And kind of Kellogg funded that. and very rigorously assessed and rigorously supported. And it's built actually by a local kind of for-profit innovation company, so it has a lot of just great um, kind of innovation into it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, I wanted to pause briefly. Uh, Mark, I saw that you listed a note about um, a recent conference you were in in Florida where there was uh, something about uh, increasing the number of certification opportunities by building in some incentives going on in that state. Did you want to address that? Yeah, I, I just want to uh, throw it in there because uh, I'll be getting the copy of the legislation that, uh, that implements that uh, in a couple of days here. And simply put is not only do schools uh, have incentives for, and in this case it was financial incentives, uh, incentives for the number of AP classes and IB classes, uh, but also the number of certifi industry certifications that their students uh, uh, received. And so it, it kind of changed the game for Florida high schools because there's now just as much emphasis on certification as there was these sort of um, uh, supposedly high-end academic credentials. Okay. Yeah, if you could uh, get a copy of that legislation and share it with us, I think that would be very useful. I'll do that. Thank you, Mark.
Okay. Coming back to students, the number eight, the, the next on the list is work study. And this was built off of work, um, a program currently being administered through the Board of Higher Ed where they do get um, subsidies to support students going in a, a work study program where they, they subsidize a portion of the student's employment. Um, a lot of times this was used to facilitate experiences like students working at the library or, or working somewhere on campus. Um, but now uh, the way IBHE has been administering that program, um, they've really been targeting them more in sector occupations, so students actually being employed within manufacturers, for example, um, and, and making sure that it's a experience that aligns with their program of study area. Um, so we wanted to highlight that as saying it's a successful program and it's, it's been funded from year to year, but certainly an increase in funding would right now, and that it's, it's unlikely that any asks for additional money are going to be fruitful. But I wanted to highlight here is something definitely that, that we would like to explore. Um, the next is credit and, uh, or credits and credit recovery. Uh, so this was a discussion that was brought on earlier in the call um, about you know, how do we make sure that students who are going through a quality work-based learning experience get some type of recognition at their school of record for that experience. So to the extent that we could look at best practices, we could look at state policies, we could look at different tools to help facilitate that discussion at the local level, we want to make sure that, that we're trying to figure out how these experiences can be deemed credit worthy. Um, in particular, um, I was interested in exploring um, how after school matters uh, might be targeted uh, with CPS as a way to get students involved in more credit recovery type activities. Um, this was something that uh, they had brought up in previous meetings and uh, I think it's, it's a project at least on a pilot basis that might be worth investigating with CPS and after school matters. Uh, but basically how do we make sure that these are credit worthy experiences and, and, and someone should take point in, in trying to figure out what are those key issues. Uh, and then finally for students we <laughs> highlighted oh, someone's comment. This is Lynn. Um, I'm a little curious about the use of the term after school programs um, and, and sometimes it links with for me with the term informal learning projects. Um, does after school programs limit time wise, limit experiences time wise if you use that definition? I'm just curious about why that particular phrase was chosen for to, mm -hmm. to discuss that concept? Um, I think it's that that's probably more me than any anybody else. And I think it was just a product of the communities that we traditionally interact with, uh, notably after school matters, and that, that's kind of how they, they define that experience. So um, if there is a better term to be using, I'm all ears. Um, but basically I was just trying to capture those types of activities that happen outside of a traditional school environment, um, but are still engaged in an educational mission. I think you, that I don't know if after school matters would uh, would accept this definition, but but I believe a larger umbrella would be called informal learning experiences. And just a suggestion to look at that. That's all. Okay. Yeah, I could look into that. I, I think also partly I was thinking about the after school matters discussion when I mm -hmm. identified this category, and I was just thinking. Uh, targeting it towards them, so I, I refer to it as after-school programs. But I would not object to the inclusion of the language informal learning experiences unless anyone else has a comment on that. I'm not sure informal is the right kind of term to use. I think what you were trying to get at was there's a typical, you know, 8 in the morning to 3, 2 in the afternoon traditional classroom, and that there's enormous amount of opportunity to use the kind of aftermarket of school, whether it's ASM or whether it's Midtown Educational Foundation or something else to have them be part of that recovery process. So if you are doing math in an after-school program and you're involved in an advanced gifted program, that should be able to be credit bearing. So I think this idea of out-of-school time versus informal, because some of it is very highly structured and very formalized, but it's just not part of a traditional K-12 package program. OK. So uh, Lynn, did you want to respond to that, or would you be open to using language more in the context of like out-of-school time? Yeah, I, I don't have anything invested in it being a particular other term. Just I thought that after school was somewhat limiting. Okay. I can uh, I will wordsmith this and, tr and try to capture both um, your comments, Lynn, as well as, Leslie, your, your description. Um, Thank you. And you can let me know if I got it wrong. Well, I'll let you know if we get, you get it right, too. 
That, that would also be very encouraging. Thank you. Um, number 10. Last one for the students was uh, this issue around college and university admission requirements. Um, again, to, to the extent that a student is doing this, they want to know that it's going to count for something. Um, so in addition to giving that validation, whether through a credential, a badge, or something like that, we want to make sure that we, we can communicate that you know, this experience will help increase the likelihood of you securing a placement and, and securing uh, a more successful transition into a post-secondary program. So I mean, th this is uh, definitely a much larger discussion, but Basically, how do we engage the Board of Higher Education, the Community College Board, to look at their admission um, office policies to explore how work-based learning experiences can be weighted in terms of decisions being made or how it could be factored in as part of the process. Um, I, I just had a, a conversation earlier today with Leslie on a related topic, but I did, Leslie, I didn't know if you wanted to kind of weigh in on this or not. I, mean, I think it's similar to the badge element. I mean, I think there's generally going to be a movement that broadens the set of criteria with which colleges can choose to identify students. Um, I think the market is asking for a lot more now. I think it's a very new field. I think that you know, obviously universities have invested an enormous amount of effort in predictive modeling what they have. But I do think there's very simple wins here where work-based learning is not weighed as heavily as, say, going to Nicaragua and building a house for a week. Or if you did a six-month internship, it's not considered quite an I hate to use the word sexy, but I think there's ways for us to verify and validate these as legitimate activities. They don't necessarily even naturally fall on a college application in any significant way. So I think even being able just to verify where they would sit in a portfolio and then how much weight can go on to that. But I do think it's a very new field, and I think it's an incredibly important way to augment the data with which colleges have to analyze skill. Um, I think it's going to be much bigger in the next couple of years. Right. Anyone else have any comments with respect to either um, the college and university admission requirements piece or, or any of the four um, recommendations that fall under students? Okay. That being uh, cooked, we'll go on to the last section, which is the employers. And there's five areas targeted here. Um, and I know, that, uh, Susan, are you still on the line? I am still here. Okay. And do, do, did Mary and Kelly ever join? Do we know? doesn't sound like it. Okay. Um, not sure if we have any other employers on the line. Oh, and, of course, uh, representing the, the biotech industry so organization. Uh, but basically, here's just a, a targeted set of um, recommendations for, for DCO, um, potentially ISB, to explore to make sure we're not only encouraging students and schools to increase opportunities, but encouraging employers to par participate and offer more activities. Um, so one area is through tax credits. Um, we used to have um, tax credits in place to support um, the placement of internships. Credits could incentivize employers uh, to support work-based learning opportunities is something that DCO um, could explore with the Department of Revenue to see if we can kind of bring that back. Um, so that's it's one area that would seem that there was a prior precedent and it's something we can explore in the future. Uh, interesting feedback I got from, um, actually it was some of our biotech partners in a conversation I had with Ann Reed, um, was whether or not really a tax credit would be something that motivates an employer to offer an experience versus it's a nice thing to have, but we would have done it anyway kind of thing. This, this doesn't necessarily, it's not a game changer for them. Um, so that conversation led me to wonder if this is necessarily a useful place to put our time. Um, but Certainly, it's a strategy that other states have used, Illinois has historically used, and is currently not using. So it might be worth our consideration in the future. Hey, um, Jason. Yes. It's, it's Anne. If I can interject. Um, I was thinking about the conversations that we had and who we were speaking to. And I, mm -hmm. I, I think that some of our, because iBio uh, and, and the iBio Institute work with large and small mm -hmm. companies, you know, through our Propel program. So I really think there's some room on this on the small company size, small to medium sized company. And I think they would go through whatever the administrative burden is to get that tax credit. Although like some of our some of our larger partners, you know, they just want to have a successful partnership and a meaningful engagement and I don't know that the tax credit would work. But but that's biotech. I mean I'm sure that there are many other industries where they would be they would have more of an interest in it. I don't know. Anyway, I just that's, didn't want to say like point. okay well yeah, okay. Yep. I don't know. Yeah, certainly. Um, when it comes to small businesses, it, it could, in fact, be a game changer. So we need to be 
cognizant of who we're getting input from, kind of what size company, what sector they're representing. Um, and certainly, I, I think there would be an appetite on the part of the commerce agencies to explore whether or not a tax credit should be part of a legislative initiative in the future. Um, and feedback has been that when companies reach a certain critical mass, they do invest in it. So if they hire 10 people and they're going to get a significant return. Mm -hmm. So it might just be the way that we sell the tax credit as, you know, large businesses get sold in one way where small businesses get sold in a different way. Mm -hmm and that the efficiency of packaging and bundling to get that done is effective for those markets. Mm -hmm. Excellent making point, it Leslie. much quicker if you have 20 employees not having to fill out 20 complicated forms, but having an aggregate kind of solution for them might make it more adoptable. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, and I think another criticism we received is the tax credit was so minimal, and like you said, it was, it was so burdensome just to even complete it for one, that if there was different ways of packaging it, it might increase utilization. And certainly exposure. I, I suspect a lot of people just didn't even know about it. Um, but I, I, I think this could be an interesting area, and it's something feasible because it's not something we have to put new money in. Tax credits are kind of inverted that way, where it's we're uh, we're, we're going in lieu of additional funds. Um, but it, it doesn't require any upfront investment on the part of the state to subsidize these things. Um, so it's certainly it's, it's not giving money that we don't have away. Um, Number 12 is looking at uh, what we call the Employer Training Investment Program. ETIP is a signature workforce development program offered through the Department of Commerce, um, uh, also supported through our Workforce uh, Investment Act system. Uh, basically, it's a training grant that um, goes to a company and it provides um, a, it covers a portion of the training expenses for a group of employees who are looking to upgrade their skills. Uh, a lot of times new businesses who come in and build facilities here, they take advantage of ETIP grants to cover the cost of training new employees. Uh, so basically, how can we use an existing program model like this that has been successful and use it to support on-the-job training programs as identified as part of this framework? So to the extent that students are being given ex work experiences, can we provide some level of subsidy to cover training for those students? Um, really, of course, this could target an adult population <coughs> who are coming out of um, university experiences as well as uh, who are in bridge programs, but it could also uh, target youth, um, particularly at the, maybe the junior and senior level, um, who are trying to get those kinds of experiences. Um, 13 is looking at procurement requirements. Um, this was actually brought up by John Furr with Holland and Knight. Um, he has, has not been able to participate directly in these meetings, but he sent a note to me that uh, one way that we can encourage um, more opportunities is by requiring that um, local districts and schools, when they do a procurement, um, that as part of their procurement contracts, they require that the vendor su um, supplying a service um, also provides access to work-based learning opportunities for students. So to the extent that it could be with a, um, a food service, it could be with um, a, a, an accounting service, uh, basically, if there's a contract, explore opportunities where you might be able to place students in some kind of work experience um, as part of that contract. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, there's legal issues that would need to be explored there. Um, a lot of questions come up, but um, I think this is something that's worth taking a look into. Okay, the, the next uh, one, 14, looks at government regulatory barriers for youth in the workplace. Um, as we know, um, depending on the sector that you're looking at, there's all kinds of health and safety considerations that need to go into effect. Certainly when looking at manufacturing and architecture and construction, having students at a work site can be incredibly um, dangerous, and there are a lot of regulations around what students have access to. Um, given the amount of regulatory barriers in place, it could be often prohibitive for any company to even um, look into trying to offer these opportunities given the risks that would be involved and the upfront research that would need to be done. Um, one thing that we would like to do is potentially look at how we can um, better review those policies and communicate more effectively what is allowable and what is not allowable to ensure that we are getting participation in some of these sectors where there are significant regulatory barriers. So it's, it's basically more of a communications piece and building transparency around the requirements. So if, if we do a better job of working with that community and outlining the do's and don'ts, maybe we can get greater interest as opposed to them saying, I would just assume that most of these activities are not allowable, so I'm going to not even engage in this type of experience. And then finally, worksite agreements. Um, this is something mentioned earlier in the call, which is basically once we get standardization down, how do we encourage local districts to increase the number of opportunities available? One way to do that, as well as for schools and employers, is to standardize some templates around worksite agreements to say, if you're looking at doing an internship, a mentorship, an apprenticeship, we can create some of the basic documents that have been vetted by uh, attorneys and, and, and other specialists that say, you know, it's kind of more fill in the blank or it's already been customized for certain experiences. Say, let, let's not have you do all the upfront work of having to 
develop this experience and go through the, the legal review, but maybe we can add value by creating some standardized worksite templates that folks can use and quickly adopt. They know they've been vetted um, and, if this, and better or, or reduce the transaction. standardization around that language. Um, so those were the, the, the five key areas under employers that, that we were hoping to potentially explore. Uh, does anyone have any comments, feedback, or input on that section? Or at this point, across really any of these areas, those are the 15 different strategies that are identified that can help move the ball forward in increasing opportunities that are aligned to the, the standards and definitions in this report. So, you know, I've gotten a lot of employer feedback, that number 15. Mm -hmm. especially if it lays out kind of the skills acquisition. So here's what we expect kind of from that structure. Yep. To have three or four of those per industry for like the top most general types of activities mm -hmm. would radically expedite their willingness to offer. Because for them to go in and design new job descriptions and new internships every time, mm -hmm. and often as an education, what they've designed does not necessarily hit our kind of skill and education goals. That this gets talked about a lot, and because it doesn't cost anything mm -hmm. um, in terms of actual investment per product, then... I think it could be a great area. And also to standardize in terms of if we want to think about badging and assessments, the more formalized we make those things, the more likely we are to be able to offer credit if they're all the same. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are ways to essentialize, say even in biotech, there's certain entry-level functions that a young person could learn that we could just systemize and like grow and increase value in over time. Exactly. I just want you to know from employers, I do get that often as the first thing they ask for. That's good to hear. Thank you, Leslie. So we definitely have I completely a start. second that. So it seems like number 15, is, as far as employers go, that's where we want to probably invest some of our initial efforts and time, uh, given the demand. Okay. Any other feedback? Or to Susan, did you have any feedback on behalf of the uh, healthcare groups? No, I just concur with what the, um, the ladies had already said. I, I completely agree. I know we saw that with the uh, toolkit when we have the information already prepared for our partners, our hospital partners, they're more willing to participate in the programs. So, Fantastic. So thank you. Um, so it seems like, according to my notes, let me flip back here, uh, number three, four, five, seven, and 15 are probably the areas that we have um, either a high amount of interest or there's a demand out there or we already have some on the ground activities taking place that we can move forward with um, relatively quickly or at least you know, take the next step on. I think the other areas, I haven't heard anyone object to any of the other strategies, so I assume those are still valid for our consideration as we continue to move forward. I really think this is an important part of this report because this really kind of defines um, what we should be spending our time on. Uh, folks like myself um, um, with the Commerce Agencies, folks like Mark Williams with the Board of Education, certainly um, those employer groups like Ann Reed, Susan uh, O'Keefe who are spending time with the employers. You know, th what we're trying to say is these are the things that would be fun and exciting to do that we think can be game changers and this over the course of the next couple of years, this is where we want to spend our efforts. Um, this is what's going to move that first part of the report forward. Um, this helps put meat on the bones, helps build tools. Um, so I, I think this is an important piece, and, and I want to make sure we get it right and we get everyone's feedback because we want to work on areas that makes the most sense. And we don't want to spend our time working on things that aren't going to have the results that we want. Okay. Um, so that, that pretty much covers the report. Um, I think that uh, I, I've, I've captured a lot of notes here about some minor tweaks and additions and wordsmithing that we can do. Um, I, I don't think we need to take any um, major changes to the, uh, the recommendations identified under Objective 2, just to give everyone a sense of what the next steps are. Um, I will circulate a, a final version of this report with some of the wordsmithing, and folks can get back to me if, if, if we still need to make some minor tweaks here and there, or if I didn't capture the notes adequately. Um, what we will do is we will share uh, the contents of this report with our interagency team that's been working on the learning exchange strategy. We will also, to the extent that um, we have working groups, uh, sector-based working groups still in process, share this information with them so they can get um, some feedback from some of the industry folks and, and some of the other folks who have been part of those sector-based working groups to say, you know, does this sequence make sense in alignment with the, the, with the course uh, model that you've been um, building on? Um, so we'll, we'll do that, but ultimately we're going to take this and this is going to be incorporated as part of our program of study definition moving forward. So as we begin to roll out, this is what we mean by manufacturing program of study as a statewide model. This is what we mean by health science. Um, 
these, you're going to see this sequence and these activities over and over again across each of those sectors. And it's going to be built in, and we're going to try to build that in as a necessary component of any program of study model. Um, so that's, that's the critical next step. Uh, once we get to the launch of the learning exchanges and we go through that procurement process, what you're going to see is we're going to be requiring um, consortia to actually develop a strategic plan on how to advance work-based learning within their sector, whether it's through industry-sponsored challenges, whether it's through the activities described here, or professional development. They want to make in the space. So we'll, we'll, this is going to directly inform that procurement process as well. So those are the critical next steps for the remainder of the year. Um, I think that's pretty much all I had to say at this point. I didn't know if anyone else on the group, uh, Mark or Natasha or anyone, wanted to make some, uh, some additional comments um, about, about the conclusion of this working group, uh, or certainly if anyone had any outstanding questions or any final comments that they wanted to make just as closure in this process. Jason, I'm just extremely impressed with this work. I think it really moves the ball down the field. And I'm, I'm impressed with the contribution of all the members. Um, this has really been a great conversation. Thank you, Mark. And, and definitely, um, I, I want to give uh, a lot of recognition to uh, Leslie Beller with um, uh, and, the, and the work that she had done with Quick in creating the work-based learning guide. Uh, as you can see, this document was really reverse engineered from the work that Leslie had put into that. Um, so, so I mean, without Leslie's contribution there, this this report would not have any basis in reality right now. Um, certainly also I wanted to thank the Metropolitan Chicago Healthcare Council and the work that they put into the Youth Partnership Toolkit um, and their partnership with DCO because it was that initial investment um, and the time put into that project that really helped inform the need to develop more statewide standardized strategies in this space. So they were kind of pioneers in getting some of these initial tools and conversations going with industry that definitely informed this process. So thank you both of you uh, for the work that you've done and, and, and you can see how it's impacted how we're trying to plan as part of a statewide strategy. We hope to continue to add value in the work that you've already done and helping to build tools and additional supports that really help advance your work. So, so thank you. Um, without you, we would not be here. Um, anybody else have anything? I think we should award Leslie a digital badge for being awesome. There you go. <laughs> the irony is I am like the, I am, I am strangely sought after now as like guide lady. I just wrote like a 120 page guide for CTE. So I'm laughing. I'm just like, um. You might want to hide that skill, Leslie, if you want. I know, no, it's like you're, you know. But I did want to acknowledge for Jason, not that we're trying to play a mutual admiration society here, but I read a lot of portfolio and when I was building the guides and all those pieces, a lot of policy papers. I feel like this is so incredibly practical it's readable to any kind of audience. It's not written as like a legislative document. It's only 11 pages for a, quite a huge industry. And I just feel like it's practical if you were a teacher on the ground just wanting to do something immediately, but it's also very practical from policy. And I think rarely documents hit that level of simplicity. So I just want to give credit, like, he also took all of my work and made it a lot easier to consume. Go, Jason. Well, thank you, Lizzie. I'm a simple man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well done. OK. Um, well, thank you. Great. Well, well, thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, we, we know this has been a long process, um, and, and we appreciate this year and at that time um, depending on how the agenda works out we may want to highlight the work of this group uh, but certainly know that um, the, the STEM strategy continues to move forward this is only a beginning and we encourage everyone to remain um, as part of that process